So it gives me really great pleasure to introduce our next speaker. Dr. Sally Lees is a professor and CANDA research chair in evolutionary and developmental biology at the University of Alberta. So she's come here from Edmonton to be with us here tonight. Um, she uh, focuses on the evolution of the first animal bodies. She leads a team of uh, postgraduate researchers looking at a variety of aspects regarding the biology of glass sponges, including reproduction, filtering and feeding, and their responses to environmental stressors. Thanks very much for, uh, for coming. Um, my uh, job here is to talk to you a little bit more about the science and the science of the live sponge, um, the, the biology of it. So glass sponges um, and glass sponge reefs are really truly remarkable um, animals and structures and habitats. And I have a video here which is going to frustratingly, oh, it does play for me, how obedient it can be. Um, so you heard from Manfred the awe of descending in the submersible. Well, each time the submersible that I use goes down from the surface waters to about 150 meters deep. It goes through this dark water of the North Pacific, and then out of the bottom come these huge white structures that are simply awesome. You cannot describe it in any other way every single time we dive. And what they're made of is these large mounds of one sponge, Ferrea, and, and golden tubes of Africalistes, and then you get these large, majestic, chalice-like structures of Heterocone, which is the one that we have on the table, Mr. Stinky. So these are the three species that build this reef. And you can see they just form these um, amazing mounds that continue on and on. But also amongst those, you see in the water lots of little shrimp, lots of little arrow worms, and then down amongst the sponges, in every crevice is a little fish. You can see rockfish almost in every spot you look, plus the pincers of crabs, of squat lobsters, and even the arms of brittle stars. So the reef, although it looks rather quiet here from this view, is actually teeming with life. So the question is, is why these sponges were actually um, here? Why these three sponges could form this reef? And why in Hackett Strait or along the coast of British Columbia in particular? What is, what's with this location? And so this is really what has prompted many of the questions that I am working on. Now, I've been working on glass sponges since I did my PhD with George Mackey at the University of Victoria in the early 90s. And from that time, I've actually learned quite a lot about glass sponges um, and the why they are particularly special. They're quite unusual as sponges go. First of all, yes, they do have a vitreous or, very, or glass skeleton. This is a clean skeleton from Africalistes. It's silica dioxide, um, and it does accumulate in the seafloor as a large amount of silica. So that is the scaffold that is underneath the living tissue of this sponge, and that living tissue sits draped over top of it and is the business part of the animal. So unlike Manfred, I'm actually interested in the living and the live and the functioning part. So this is a scanning electron micrograph of the body wall of one sponge, a Ferrea ochre. So I have one that is actually rather stinky still <laughs> because it's quite recent collection. And this is a small portion, and I'll put it out here, um, of Ferrea. Now that scanning electron micrograph shows you a cross-section of the body wall, and it's really only a few hundred micrometers thick, extremely thin. And the sponge is made up of, of passages which bring water in through the, um, the body wall and through the tissue and out other passages, and this is how it filters. And you can see fluorescein dye here put onto a sponge that is being drawn through and coming out like a chimney. The structure that's responsible for that is this. It's a pump cell, and it, what it does is it beats a flagella, which is a whip-like structure, backwards and forwards, and that draws water at its base. And so hundreds of these line chambers in this body wall and there's hundreds of thousands of such chambers. And their whip-like um, action draws the water through, and, uh, and so it filters um, the water. And what it does is it filters bacteria. The smallest passage is this tiny area here, and it's called the collar. And that dimension has a small matrix on it that's um, ten thousandths of a millimeter. 
And so in that way, it's very efficient at trapping bacteria. Bacteria are about one micrometer um, or smaller. Now, the interesting thing is you'd think it would be very good at it, and it is. And it has to be because there actually aren't that many bacteria in the water. So at the surface, where Kim was describing, all the animals are having their sunshine business, there's about um, a million bacteria per milliliter approximately uh, um, in the water. But once you get down to the reef, there's a tenth of that. So it's interesting to figure out how much um, energy, how much bacteria it requires to actually filter to live. Okay, well another thing about glass sponges that makes them very unusual is that they are in fact made up of a single giant cell. Unlike you or I, they have nuclei strewn throughout their tissues. These are the functioning controlling units normally of a single cell. And here they're distributed across a giant cytoskeleton. The cell skeleton goes for hundreds and hundreds of micrometers. Why have such a strange structure? It turns out that if you have one continuous giant cell, you can send electrical signals through it. Because if you have, if you have cell boundaries, it's an impedance to electrical current. And sponges have no nerves. This is the um, one group of organisms that really has no electrical way of otherwise signaling. But the glass sponge, by having one giant cell, is able to send electrical signals through its tissue. And George Mackey and I were able to record such an electrical signal here. We used stimulating electrodes here, and we were able to suck onto a portion of the tissue and look at the flow coming out of the sponge. And when you stimulated it, you found that there was an electrical signal at the same time that the flow through the sponge, the filtration, stopped. So that's what it does with um, its signaling. And why would it do that? It's because, actually, if you put sediment on the sponge, the sponge is sensitive to sediment. So filters, in general, will clog. Now, this is a, how we record in the lab using a, a flow meter. And you can see that the sponge pumps and occasionally stops pumping, so it stops filtering. But if you purposely put sediment onto the sponge, it actually causes it to stop or arrest. And then after a while, it starts to test the water until it, the water is clear enough and it filters again. Now, pretty well, all filters will do this. All animals that have a filtration structure will arrest their filtering in order to protect the filter, because presumably it's expensive or it's costly to repair any damage that would be caused by taking in too much material. So this is a fairly common kind of a response. But to have a giant cell to be able to do this is completely unusual. And so with a student of mine, Gabrielle, Tompkins McDonald, we were able to do this in the lab and show that in tank work, if you introduce sediment, here's one glass sponge. After only 10 minutes of exposure, it stops it pumping and then it comes on again. And this is the one of the reef forming sponges, Africalistes. And again, after this exposure, it slowly went down and then it, it starts to pump again. So clearly, this is what happens. But this is really the work that prompted um, our exploration that I'm going to talk to you about um, now. And that is, d does sponge filtration really get arrested in situ, in the field? Is this something that's affecting the sponges? And so this is what prompted an expedition um, that was mounted last October, uh, which has consumed a large portion of my group's work uh, for the last few months. And so the expedition's purpose was really to determine what effect the glass sponges in the reefs have on their environment. What allows the sp these sponges, of all of them, to form reefs in Hecate Strait? And then finally, whether sedimentation, possibly kicked up by trawling activities, even in the nearby vicinity, might have an effect on that filtration. And that's a pretty high order um, request. Can we quantify the effect it has on their filtration capacities? And so this work is uh, certainly non-trivial and has been um, the um, uh, made b possible by so many people, including Department of Fisheries and Oceans, NSERC Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council, CEPOS, and a whole suite of people, including um, the Canada Coast Guard. And this is the um, Canada Coast Guard ship, the Tully, which we used uh, for two weeks in October last year to go up to Hecate Strait. And we also used an extremely capable remote-operated vehicle. This is a submersible called Ropos. 
And ROPOS is um, a highly capable ROV, and it also comes with a highly capable crew. Its pilots um, have worked with us at the reefs for quite some years now and are able at manipulating these arms, which have, are robotic arms, with extreme dexterity. It has many sampling capacities, it has platforms for putting instruments on, and it has a whole suite of video um, recording instruments. And so the ship crews is involving a whole suite of different factors, including making instruments um, like this, including a very a capable group of students and postdocs who put together the instruments, including um, a team of people who can help turn the ROV around in record time, collecting our water samples, and also log the data um, as we dive, because we use 24-hour operations to maximum, maximize our time for the cost, because these ships are, I won't tell you how many um, thousands of dollars to use per day. And so when we get in the water, this is the view we have. We sit behind the screen, and we have um, the pilots operating the, the ROV, the submersible, and we have impressive GPS locations. We can actually uh, put an instrument down and find it within one meter. So we can actually um, deploy things and ret retrieve them very easily. We can see the, um, the bottom, we can map the bottom, and we can do all kinds of sampling. And so here's an example um, video of deploying some instruments that I have built to record the flow around the sponges. So these robotic arms may look clumsy, but you look, they can put one of these um, less than a centimeter diameter probe into a two centimeter diameter opening of the sponge. And I've built these instruments to be able to record the flow and the oxygen out of the sponge and in the ambient water. So what I'm trying to do here is determine the oxygen used, and that is the energy used to filter water over time. And so one of the things you also need on work like this is cooperative weather. And I'll tell you, in October, that's a hard thing to come by in Hecate Strait. And we sat for about five days uh, in Kitimat and went around Banks Island for three, three times until we had a weather window of 36 hours. It looked like 24 hours, but we were ready. And so when we got out there, we were ready to collect um, the data. We got down, we put the instruments down, and then another storm came in with 60 knot winds, and we hauled all the instruments up at one dive on one platform, and they were all intact. It was perfect. And so we pulled the instruments up, um, and then had to move on to other sites. But let me tell you a little bit about what we've analyzed from that data. So this is one of the things we did while the instruments were recording those two sponges. This is a, a, what we call a SIP sampler. It's to record the water filtered by the sponge. Um, and these are canisters that are evacuated, and we take them down and put one end into the sponge um, vent, and the other that sits in the ambient water, and then we pull them open and they fill very, very slowly at a, at a rate slower than the sponge is actually filtering. And then we do more and more, and it takes quite a long time to pull each one um, before we come up. Our data from that is a um, 24-hour period of only for that data. It shows what the sponge is actually filtering. And basically, there's a net removal of bacteria. They're bacteriovores. They eat bacteria. And then they excrete ammonium. Now, bacteria are carbon and nitrogen, and the sponge takes those in and uses them to make energy, and then it produces carbon dioxide, as we do, and ammonium. And that ammonium goes up into the water column and is recycled for use by other animals. So it's a very important part of what we call benthic pelaging, coupling. So one of the other things we were able to do is record the flow out of all of the sponges that we could encounter. And I can tell you that this sponge, Ferrea, has um, oscula that are about, or openings, these are the vents, they're about two centimeters in diameter. And they pump water, they filter water at one to two centimeters per second. If you have 200 such oscula, and this particular one has more than that, you are filtering at two centimeters per second, you're filtering 100,000 liters a day. So that is this one bush. But this particular sponge, Heterocone, actually filters faster. It's pumping at about five to seven centimeters per second. And its opening here is 30 centimeters, I mean, yeah, 30 centimeters across. 
And so that single sponge itself even filters more at 300 thousand liters per day. And I had to get my head around this, so I went and looked for what that would be, and a uh, 50,000 liter water tank would be that big. Now that is this one bush that is filtering that amount of water. And so one of our um, goals, and Lauren will talk about that in a moment, is to scale up and understand the, the actual processing power of this entire reef. It is a remarkable amount, and it's unknown elsewhere in any habitat to have that amount of, of filtration occurring. Okay, so what were the other instruments doing? And yes, I'm going to risk showing you some graphs because you're here to see these things. So here we have our two instruments recording over the sponges. And here what we have is tidal patterns at Hecate Strait. So we had actually some other instruments down showing us that as the tide comes in, it rises over the sponge reefs, and then it drops again, and then it rises. This is our 24-hour period that we recorded. And so as the tide goes up, this red line shows the little recorder that I have in the sponge, and it's of, over the sponge, and it shows the sponge, um, the tide over the sponge goes up, and this is the one out of the sponge, and it shows that the sponge filtration also rises. So the sponge filters more water when the tide is higher. Now that's quite interesting. We're also able to, um, to monitor exactly how much oxygen is removed as the sponge filters. So what does, it, what does that show? It turns out that at low tide, when there's not much flow, the sponge is not filtering very much water, but it's actually using a lot of oxygen. And when the tide is high, when we've got incoming tide, the amount of water processed by that sponge really grows up. And amazingly, the cost, the amount of oxygen it uses goes down. Now, it must do this, or we presume it does, by using the ambient flow rather like a chimney. So this sponge is extremely skinny. And I showed you, you can't really see it on, on the big one here, but this wall is so flimsy, there's barely anything to it. And so really by having such a little resistance to water through it, it probably takes advantage of that ambient flow to suck water through itself. And so this is a calculation that we've done to determine um, what effect this might have on its, its um, energy. And basically we find that 75% of the water is filtered at those high tides. And it does that using a quarter of the energy. Now at low tide then, the sponge is barely processing any, and it's probably not got a lot of bacteria left around it. That's another thing. There's probably a soup living around it. And then as the tide comes in, that new water is bringing new bacteria, and it's processing a lot more. So those high tide periods seem to be extremely important for this sponge. And it's what we imagine is giving it the energy to build these reefs. OK, so the bottom line then comes in what what would be the effect of sedimentation of increased particulates in the water on filtration. And I'll have to tell you that in 24 hours, we weren't able to complete all of that. Um, we were, however, able to see <coughs> that sedimentation in the field does cause arrests of the sponge pumping. And this is work that we still have to, um, to work up. But considering that so much energy is required, for the sponge during those periods of high tide, it is quite likely that if there were sedimentation in the water at that time, we will see that um, severely compromised. However, we need more than that one day, and we're planning to go back up th to the reefs to continue that um, in 2017. So that will be the, um, the objective, one of the primary objectives of that trip. So I have... Um, so many students in my group who've made this possible. Um, I've listed some of them here. And Lauren will now talk about her work. But also um, to, to mention that really this is a cooperative effort, a mammoth effort of um, DFO Oceans and Science um, and, and CEPOS, and then the funding also from Natural Science and Engineering Research Council, without whom it really couldn't be possible. Thank you.